It's probably the most enjoyable way to learn a language. I'm not always willing to put in the effort needed. This is the method that I think has helped me the most in my language journey. That is something of a dirty word in language learning nowadays. My brain just doesn't work like that. Trying to use this method is absolutely useless. So sometimes you have to use methods that will force your brain to memorize things even when it doesn't want to. I feel like I'm not useless, that I have done something. Hi y'all, it's Cameron. Today I thought I'd talk to you about language learning and the methods that I have found useful for me and some of the methods that are popular but I don't find particularly useful. Don't take anything that I say today as gospel. Everyone has a different personality, everyone has different learning styles, likes and dislikes. The language learning process is also a discovery process of the things that you like to do and the things that work for you. Methods that do work for reinforcing things you've already learned or maintaining skill levels that you've already achieved. I won't be addressing that today. I will only be addressing these methods in terms of did it help me learn new things about the language that I'm studying and how effective, how good of a time and effort investment was it? The first method I want to talk about is talking a lot, having a lot of conversation. I don't like this at all. Again, this is specifically in terms of learning new bits of language. I find it highly inefficient for myself. And this can come in the form of a class which really focuses on conversation, maybe a language exchange or a language meetup where you're meeting people specifically to talk. And this could even mean having a lot of friends that you speak in the foreign language with or dating someone, even marrying someone that uses the foreign language that you want to study. I generally don't like talking to people if it's not a conversation that I really care about. That sounds bad, I know. But if you're learning a new language, that means that you aren't good in the language to begin with. So what ends up happening a lot of times is you just have these same mundane conversations over and over. What do you like to do? On the weekends, I like to... It's not fun. There are very few times that I've gone to a language exchange and come out of it really feeling like I've learned a lot of new language. I might have practiced the language, the skills that I already know, but coming out of it learning new things is not easy to do. One, because it's sometimes really difficult to stop the conversation and say, hey, what does that word mean? Then if they're kind enough to explain it, then you had to have understood it, and hopefully you've made a note of it because you're not going to be able to address that again until after you go home and review everything that you talked about. It can be really good for practicing skills that you already have, but learning new things, it doesn't really work for me. And there are so many interpersonal weird things because you're meeting someone, you know that you're using each other for practice and you're not actually interested in them a lot of times. It even gets really weird when you're dating someone or you're friends with someone because there can sometimes be a struggle about which language you should be using, which language you want to use. And then someone always feels like they're just being used for language practice and you don't actually want to be their friend or you don't actually want to date them for the person that they are. It can be a really big mess and I don't really care to do it. <laughs> to go out of my way to go to a language exchange or to make friends specifically for the purpose of using the language, learning the language, not high on my priority list. But there is a study method that I do go out of my way to look for if it is available to me. Classes. So this could be what you would consider a traditional language class or even one-on-one -on -one tutoring. I would probably lump those together. I like a good class. Most foreign language classes that I've been in I have found useful. That might be a little controversial because I know that there are a lot of foreign language influencers who say that classes are a waste of time, you can do all of these other things to learn languages faster. And I wouldn't necessarily disagree with them because classes are only as effective as the effort that you put into them. If you are paying your tuition and going to class and listening, but then doing nothing else other than that, you're not going to get your money's worth out of a class. Personally, I find that with a foreign language class, you should not be learning new material in class. 
most of the time. Almost all classes, you're going to be provided with a textbook. And if you want the most out of that class, you need to be looking ahead, learning the material on your own, and then going to class and using that as an opportunity to practice what you've learned, solidify the skills, have your teacher check and make sure you've understood things correctly. And then if you didn't understand it, you're able to ask questions. And I feel that is the reason why a lot of people don't like classes is because they aren't going to put in the effort outside of class. They're, they're just going to expect that going to the class is enough and that is never enough. I think personally having a class of about six to eight people in it is most ideal. I don't think that you necessarily need a one-on-one -on -one session with a teacher all the time because most often I'm the type of person, I'm gonna raise my hand in class every time I have a question and I will hog the teacher's time if I need to. I don't feel bad about that. And another thing is in a class setting, my competitive drive really comes out. In a, in a foreign language class, I wanna make friends with people, but I wanna be better at the language and also be your friend. I'm not that competitive in other things. Like sports, I really could not care less. So I'm not going to try hard like on the soccer field or on the basketball court, but put me in a language classroom and I am going to try my darndest to be the best student in that class. And I prefer classes in person rather than online, which having classes in person, they're more expensive and they can be hard to find in your area sometimes depending on where you live. So there are other methods that people do as well. Textbooks. I know a lot of people do not like studying from a textbook, but oh, a good textbook is worth its weight in gold. And if you are the type of person who likes to study languages out of a book, they are great for you. Now, all textbooks are not created equally. There are some textbooks that I've really loved and some that I haven't. And I can't really give you examples because if I did, the Korean education publishing industry might all be mad at me. So I will just kind of explain the things that I look for in a textbook. First, I look for anything that has an audio recording. If it does not have an audio recording, I'm probably not even going to look at it. Even though my main focus will probably be on the written and reading aspects of that textbook, I will want to know if I am pronouncing it correctly in my head. I don't really like textbooks that focus on one particular element. So if a textbook is only grammar and it's just grammar after grammar after grammar after grammar, I'm not a big fan of that. On the flip side, if it's just a bunch of example sentences or it is just a bunch of vocab terms, I'm not going to really enjoy that either. I do like your standard. At the very beginning, you have a dialogue that uses all of the different vocab terms and grammar patterns that you're going to be using in that chapter. And then there are exercises, there are explanations, and then maybe at the end there's a vocabulary list or something explaining the culture. One thing that I really like having are exercises where I'm having to write sentences. But there are certain exercises in textbooks that I really don't like. For example, open-ended essay questions. I'm not going to write that. I'm going to skip right over it because even if I write it, who's gonna check it if I'm working by myself? Of course, if it's an assignment from a teacher, yes. But otherwise, I'm just using the language and I might be using it wrong. I like it whenever there are short sentences that you are supposed to be making that you can go back and check and make sure that you have formulated those sentences correctly. I don't like textbooks where there are zero to no exercises. There needs to be something that you're doing actively in the book. But let's be honest, a lot of people don't like textbooks because they seem inorganic or they're just boring. So what are some other methods you can do? Extensive media consumption. This could be reading a lot of books in your target language, watching TV, watching movies, listening to music, all of the things that we do for too many hours every day, instead of doing it in your mother tongue, doing it in the target language. This has never worked for me. I know some people that this works great. There are people that I've met here in Korea that have great English and I asked them, well, how did you learn English so well? Not only do you understand everything that I'm saying, but your pronunciation is actually really good. And they said, I watched all 10 seasons of Friends and that's it. <laughs> I have never. I I can watch 10 seasons of a show and by the end of it, not know the name of the main character. My brain just doesn't work like that. And I know for some people it does. 
and I'm very jealous of you and it really frustrates me, but it doesn't work for me. There are only a few instances where I know that it has worked for me. Words that are just hard to explain even if you look it up in a dictionary. If I were to give a Korean example, it would be something like yokshi. Yokshi is a word that doesn't translate well into English, and so having seen it used in many different situations, I've kind of learned the edges of what it means and what it doesn't mean. If extensive media consumption works for you, I say go for it because it's probably the most enjoyable way to learn a language, but for me it is very ineffective and I will watch something for enjoyment but it is not a way that I am really going to learn any new language. The only recent example I can think of where this method taught me anything was I watched the entire season of 이상한 변호사 우영우 and I only learned one vocab term, 섭섭하다. I think you know the scene that I'm talking about. And it's a term that I had kind of already known what it meant but I didn't know where to use it. And from now on, Sopsopada will always be connected to that scene where the main male character uses it. I don't know if from a language learning standpoint, if watching the entire series of Isangan Pyonosa Uyongu was worth learning Sopsopada. Did I enjoy the show? Yes. Do I think that people should have a light-hearted engagement with media in other languages if they enjoy that? Yes, but if I'm going to actually learn a language, I'm going to have to analyze that media content a lot more closely, which brings me to the next method. Intensive media consumption. So this is still taking materials that were intended for native speakers to either read or watch as a form of entertainment or otherwise, but you are now using as a language learner to really dive in deep. Instead of reading or watching or listening to a lot of different things, you are focusing on one piece, one bit of material, and you are really analyzing it down to the nitty gritty. So if it's a book, maybe you're taking a paragraph, a page, a chapter, and really looking at every word you don't know, every grammar structure that you don't know. It's a very slow process. <laughs> it is not meant for you to engage with media the way it was intended. It can be rewarding because you do find a lot of expressions that match your interests. Because if it's already a piece of media content that you enjoy, then you actually don't mind learning what they're saying. The times that I've had trouble with this is when I've, out of guilt or a sense of necessity, tried to analyze something that I don't particularly enjoy. I'm not really a music person, but being here in Korea, I have felt sometimes that I should take a very popular Korean song and analyze all of the lyrics so that I could sing it. That isn't really genuine to who I am as a person. I can listen to an uh, American pop song, a song in English, a million times and have absolutely no idea what they're saying because I don't pay attention to lyrics to begin with. Anything where I would not generally have a natural interest in this, ha trying to use this method is absolutely useless. It is a method I have used to great effect in the past, but it's it takes a lot of effort and it can ruin your enjoyment of the material. There are sometimes TV shows that I really enjoy and then I try and use this method to study and then I just end up hating the show because I spent too much time with it. This method kind of lends itself well to being connected with another method that I do find quite effective. Shadowing, self-talk, monologue memorization, background music, these are all things that I'm going to lump into one because there is a certain amount of memorization involved and then you reproducing that. And I kind of really like this method. I wish I did it more. And the reason I don't do it more is it does take effort and I'm not always willing to put in the effort needed. I am someone who enjoys acting. I've done it since I was a young child in like church plays and school plays, something that I've always enjoyed. I love getting a script, memorizing it, and then repeating it, putting in the emotion. So for me, this method works really well. But I do think if you take like a TV show, a movie, even song lyrics, 
listen and remember exactly how the native speaker said it, and then you reproduce it with the same emotion, the same inflections, I think that is great for language study, at least in my experience. I do feel that there is a certain amount of memorization that is needed, a certain amount of rote memorization that is needed that is something of a dirty word in language learning nowadays. But I find with rote memorization sometimes, it builds patterns in my brain that I don't have to focus on that anymore and I can focus on other things. If I can have that grammar structure already in my brain and I just have to put in different vocabulary terms, that is really helpful for me. Even just shadowing where you are listening and then immediately repeating it afterwards has been really effective and really useful and it can be fun. You could recite a scene of one of your favorite shows or sing the lyrics of a song that you memorize that you really like. And this is going to take those pathways in your brain and make them more clear, make them deeper. So the next time that you have to produce them when you're actually having a conversation, that you don't have to think about it. But this takes a lot of effort because there is quite a bit of memorization involved. And the human brain doesn't like to memorize things if it doesn't have to. The whole reason that we forget things is because the human brain is trying to conserve energy. So sometimes you have to use methods that will force your brain to memorize things even when it doesn't want to. Flashcards, specifically spaced repetition. This is the method that I think has helped me the most in my language journey. And that's controversial because some people really love this method and some people don't like it. So anyone who doesn't know, spaced repetition is essentially classic flashcards, but you're often using a computer program that times the flashcards later and later as you get them correct. It shows it to you once, you get it correct, it'll show it to you again in a day. Then when that day comes, you get it correct again. So it shows three days later, then seven days later, 12 days later. That interval keeps getting larger so that that knowledge goes into your long-term memory. I myself, I was pretty religious with this method for a long time. I swore by it. It was something I did every single day. And I do think it helped me get to where I am. I'm someone that loves a good flashcard. It is almost like a game to me. Being able to see a word in my own language and know what it is in a foreign language and vice versa, there is a certain amount of satisfaction. There is a certain amount of psychological safety even that the world has answers and if I just study and know it I can succeed. My personality sometimes really needs that. Sometimes when I'm stressed with other things in my life I do flashcards because at least I know I can do that correctly. If everything in my life is going up in flames but I answer a flashcard correctly I feel like I'm not useless that I have done something that <laughs> all of the studying I have done, there is, <laughs> I have something to show for it. And it gives me a sense of self-worth. Is that healthy? Probably not, but it does encourage me to continue using this method. This is a very intense method. You have to do it pretty much every day, especially if you're using a computer program. The way that space repetition works, it's hard to take a day off because then you just have to end up doing double the amount of flashcards on the next day. And heaven forbid you take like a week off for a vacation, you're gonna have so many cards that are backed up that it's going to be very <laughs> disheartening. But I think in my most intense period with this method, it did wonders for my vocabulary base, just the, the random words that you know you're going to need at some point but you're not always going to use it. For example, the word kaitegi, which means funnel. I learned that word, I don't know where, but thank goodness I put it in my spaced repetition software and it came up every once in a while. So when I was on a filming and we were trying to pour liquid into a jar and I said, I need a funnel, I knew what the term was. I didn't have to search for it because I already knew it. Now. Will I ever have to use the word funnel again in my life? Probably not ever, but that's the way language learning works. With your native language, you just know a billion and a half words that you've maybe used once. 
I could probably explain the concept of a funnel if I needed to, but the fact that I have that somewhat obscure term that I can just bring up at any moment is something that I don't think I would get from most other methods. Some people really don't like flashcards. They do not like chugging through all of these flashcards day in and day out. They want something that is more organic and they want something honestly that's a little more fun. Study abroad. I have done a lot of it. I've studied abroad in Japan. I've studied abroad in China, also Korea for many years in many locations. Do I think it's an effective study method? Not exactly, actually. I do enjoy study abroad a whole lot, and I think that it was important for my language learning journey, but I don't think it was because I studied abroad that I learned the language. There are many people who live abroad who, especially if you're a native English speaker, never learn the language. I know people, I know people in Korea They've lived here for 20 plus years and they can't speak a lick of Korean. Being in the location itself is not what is going to get you to learn the language. The effort that I put in while I was studying abroad, I could probably actually just do that at home. The big difference is, is that there are so many more native speakers around you, so you always have someone to practice with. But I have heard horror stories of people who have studied abroad that they really just spend time around people that speak the same language as they do and they never actually learn anything. That just seems like a big waste of time and money. Like a lot. It's a lot of money and it's a lot of time and it's a lot of stress. So from a strictly language learning standpoint, studying abroad isn't the key to anyone's language learning success. I was going to language classes while I was abroad. If I hadn't done that very deliberate studying, even when I was living abroad, I probably would not have learned the language. Study abroad in and of itself, I don't find to be the most efficient way to learn a language. And there is another method that a lot of people recommend that is very related that I do not find all that effective at all. Changing your environment into your target language. This is things like taking your phone and turning it into Korean if you're studying Korean or your computer or things that you would naturally do, anything that you can, switching it into that other language. And I've done this in the past and it's not completely useless for me, but if I'm gonna be honest, when I'm using my phone, I'm not actually looking at the words on the screen. I mean, yes, I'm looking at texts, but as far as the words that are underneath icons or when I go into settings, I'm not actually looking at whatever language, English or otherwise. The only time that I really look at this is whenever I have a problem. And that is not a time when I actually wanna be reading the foreign language. So what ends up happening is I go into the settings, I switch it into English, figure out what a problem is, and then after I've solved it, I go back and switch it back into the foreign language and go about my way. I don't really learn a lot of new words. I don't really find it this useful. If you want to do it, you can do it. I think right now, yeah, right now my phone is in English. I have had it in Korean. I've had it in Japanese in the past, but there is one more method that I wanna talk about that is supposedly outdated and a lot of people say don't do it but I've actually found kind of useful. Translation. Now, this is probably one of the oldest language learning techniques ever. It's something that they've been doing since, I guess, at least ancient Greece, probably more. And it's really fallen out of fashion. People say, oh, don't translate, it's not good. And in my experience, that's not really the case. I don't think it's good for it to be your only method, but whenever I have employed it, I have found quite a bit of usefulness to it. Of course, it would always be great if you had a native speaker who could check your translation if you're going from your mother tongue into your target language. But even if not, one method that I have found that I enjoy about translation and that I found effective was taking something that was in my target language, translating it into my own language, so English, and then retranslate it back into my target language. And then I can take my, my translation and the original that was in my target language and see how different they are. For me, it's been great to, in that first step, make sure that I've understood the meanings of everything as I translate it into English. 
And then when I translate it back and then comparing it, seeing if I have the same language instincts as a native speaker would. Having that step where I'm taking something in English and trying to put it into a foreign language, it helps me to see, oh, this is quite different than English. I can't approach this idea in the same way that I would approach it in English. This has never been the main thing that I've done to learn a language, but I have found a lot of value in it. And for it to be kind of demonized in a way that it should never be used, I think is a little bit of uh, misled advice because it is, especially if you enjoy something like that, if it matches your type of personality, it can be a very useful and a very good way to learn language in my experience. So that has been my experience with these different methods of studying language. They are not all of the ways of studying. So you may have a method that I don't even know about of which I would love to hear about it in the comments because I'm always looking for better ways to learn language. As I mentioned earlier in the video, these are my opinions and my experiences with these methods. I don't think you should be taking anybody's word as gospel because everyone's brain is different and this is a process that in the end, you're gonna have to try a bunch of things and figure out what works for you. But I hope some of the things I said today are helpful and will aid you in your discovery of your own unique study method. And I wish you all the best in your studies. Bye-bye.